Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. We at Impetus Digital have built some of the best-in-class asynchronous and synchronous virtual communication and collaboration tools for life science companies. We help companies do everything from virtual advisory boards, working groups, steering committees, investigator meetings. We even help them with things like big corporate meetings. We can do um, virtual conferences, and the list goes on. But more importantly at Impetus, we really believe that everything starts with a conversation. And from these big, hairy, audacious conversations, we can work with some of the provocateurs, the people who are working on leading edge technologies, concepts, um, innovations, um, like the people we have at the table today, um, Nance and Denise, and we can all work to collectively and positively disrupt healthcare. And so I'm super excited to have a couple of really amazing women entrepreneurs that I am so stoked to be able to speak with today. Um, the first person I want to introduce is Nance Dicciani. And uh, she actually has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in chemical engineering. So one of our STEM uh, graduates here, so love it. And she holds an MBA from the Penns Wharton School. She has extensive experience working in the energy and materials industries, including working in multiple senior leadership positions. Together with Denise Devine, so who we have here today, and Dr. Jeff Joseph, who we don't, she is actually the co-founder of RTM Vital Signs and also serves as the CEO. She also sits on the boards of directors for several companies with a combined total worth of over 200 billion. In 2006, Nance was appointed by President George W. Bush to the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and has served on the boards and executive committees of the American Chemistry Council and the Society of Chemical Industry. She has been ranked twice as one of the world's 100 most powerful women by Forbes magazine. I also want to take a couple of minutes to introduce Denise Devine. She's a certified accountant and holds an MBA in finance from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the co-founder of RTM Vital Signs, as well as the CAO and the CFO. So if one position wasn't enough, you've got to have two. She has over 25 years of leadership experience in general management, operations, and finance. And she has a particular expertise in developing technology platforms, with resulting commercialized production applications, intellectual property and IP strategy, as well as acquisitions, licensing, joint ventures, and a whole series of other strategic alliances. She's also the founder, um, she's also been a founder or a co-founder of up to three different companies. And one of them that was a not-for-profit organization. She serves in, in leadership roles on multiple boards and is also a co-inventor and over 19 US and international patents. So welcome ladies, so wonderful to have you in the show today. We're Great pleased to be, to be here. here. Thank you very much. So um, I'm actually just gonna have either one of you jump in. It's just such interesting backgrounds, um, so uh, provocative and obviously an interesting trajectory for both of you not having healthcare backgrounds and suddenly to find yourself in the healthcare industry. Maybe we'll start with you, Nance. How did you find yourself where you are today? Actually, when, when I was in school, I actually minored in biochemical engineering and, and biomedical engineering. And both of my uh, dissertations and theses were on touching on the, on, on the medical field. So it's an area that I've always been interested in, even though I haven't spent the majority of my career in it. But I got involved with, uh, with RTM because Jeff Joseph, our, our, our third co-founder, is a longtime friend. And, and I know known Jeff and his family for probably close to 30 years. And Jeff is the, the, the consummate inventor. And I've got some tinkering in my background as well. And, and so whenever we would socialize, Jeff and I would, would end up uh, in his basement and he'd show me the latest things that, that he was working on. And, and they were all, he's a cardiac anesthesiologist by training, 
and they were always in the medical areas. And so we always said to one another, one day, one day we're going to do something together, you know? And that one day finally came and we decided that one of the greatest needs in healthcare is in a general area of cardiology. And that's where we started RTM, which stands for Real Time Monitoring, RTM. Love so it. That's how, that's how I got involved. I love it. So nicely said and so succinctly. How about you, Denise? What was, what was your journey like? Well, interestingly enough, I, I, my bachelor's degree is in accounting, but I took enough chemistry and biology courses to have a minor in sciences, which was highly unusual. So I'm sort of a right-brained accountant. Um, <laughs> I've always been interested in the overall umbrella of, of uh, health and wellness. And so my, my uh, two prior uh, ventures were in that space. And um, I developed uh, patents and products in both the functional food and OTC drug space. Um, I came to RTM because Nancy and I served together on the board of uh, Villanova University uh, Board of Trustees. And she told me you know, about this venture and asked me if I wanted to become involved. And, and I've always been very driven by impact and, and this was very exciting. So that's what got us both together. So Nancy's the connector here. I love it, good, good stuff. So all of us probably want to hear more about an over-encompassing viewpoint about what RTM or real-time monitoring vital signs is. What do you do as a company? I guess starting off with the inspiration. It sounds like your other co-founder was, you know, a big leading factor in there. What are you sort of offering in terms of services, products, and typically who are your customers? So we'll start with you, Nance. Okay, R RTM is a medical device company. And we are focused on developing real-time continuous monitoring of what we would consider to be vital, vital signs of two of the greatest needs in healthcare, cardiac and respiratory health. And we want to do this both in the hospital and out of the hospital all the time and anywhere. Right now, this really can't, it just can't be done. One of the things that's really interesting and, and um, that's happened over the last 10 months in this pandemic situation we've all been living in is that the whole concept of telemedicine and remote monitoring has really gained an awful lot of traction. And it's not just about having a Zoom call with your doctor. Ultimately, the future of medicine is going to be in monitoring, analyzing, predicting, preventing adverse events with the individual patient. So we're moving more and more towards customized medicine. And that's exactly what RTM is focused on. So we've Fantastic. got the two, two, two devices, both for, for cardiac, and we can talk about a little bit more detail on both of those, but the cardiac device and the respiratory device. Fantastic. So um, Denise, just wanting to focus a little bit on um, what you're trying to do around supporting the transformation of healthcare. So we're really, as, as Nance was mentioning, we're really trying to get away from this reactive system of dealing with sickness to more of a wellness model. Um, right. So getting to more of a preventative, proactive, evidence-based and very person-centered, so patient-centric. So looking at this in the big picture, what has to happen in healthcare? And again, we could see COVID-19 as being a bit of an accelerant for this, but what needs to happen in order for us to get into a milieu or an ecosystem that, that's much more preventative focus as per what you're doing at RTM uh, and for us to be able to, to move the needle, if you will, to make this more mainstay and mainstream. Okay, so, so first of all, we have a, a good example on the medical side of how that's already happened, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but, but just in terms of the big picture, what has to happen, and I think COVID has accelerated this with all the Zooming with your doctor, what has to happen is the insurance companies 
have to reimburse at a reasonable rate for teledoc calls and for these devices. And we've talked to the CEO of a major insurance company in our area who has said that they're already working on plans because they have seen through COVID the need for and the effectiveness of doing you know, remote monitoring and remote uh, right. meetings with your doctor. So that's, that's in the ecosystem of the pay system, which really has to happen to make this be very robust. Um, on a personal side, on the technology side, what we've seen in terms of continual monitoring, and, and this is another thing that got me very excited about RTM, Dr. Joseph is quite an expert in diabetes and uh, continual glucose monitoring, and he really did uh, contribute a great deal to the technology for the glucose monitor, which completely changed the standard of care for diabetics. His concept was to do the same thing for blood pressure to the extent that we can continually monitor blood pressure so that doctors can adjust medication in real time. We can definitely prevent cardiac events and keep the costs down in the system. Love it. Beautiful. And so I want to take a couple of minutes and sort of double click, if you will, on each of these new tools that you've created. First one we'll start on is really the cardiovascular monitor. Nance, can you actually describe to us a little bit about what this is? How does it work? Um, not get, obviously getting into the IP around the algorithm, but just how do people get monitored and what are we monitoring? Sure, a actually the, the initial focus of our monitor is the entire blood pressure waveform. And our device is about as big as the tip of your little finger. And it would be implanted in an outpatient procedure under local anesthesia with some sedation in right below the surface of the skin on the mammary artery in the chest, which is at the same level as the heart. The device will go around the artery and we, the, our device, we already have seven patents on it, including the device which will basically implant it. And this will go around the outside of the artery and it will measure the full blood pressure waveform. And I'll tell you in a second where we are on the, on the status of that. But event, that's the hardest thing to do without any, any patient involvement accurately, continuously, in real time, and have the capability to send the measurements and information to a patient's cell phone, a physician, or a central monitoring station. The, the, the key thing here is that there are over 100 million people in this country alone that have uncontrolled hypertension. And as a result of that, there are a thousand people who die every day, sudden deaths. We have over a million heart attacks in this country alone a year. We have over 800,000 strokes in this country a year. The major cause of all of those things is uncontrolled hypertension. But yet we don't know what happens two minutes, 20 minutes, two hours, two days, before someone has one of these adverse cardiac events. We just don't know. The way to, to mitigate these kinds of things is to control. The way to control hypertension is to monitor. And that's exactly what we are, what we are trying to do. Brilliant. Denise, with that said, there's something really interesting about this idea of ambient biometrics, the idea of seamlessly accessing people's parameters and metrics without them even knowing. So there's something very, obviously very seamless about that and intuitive. So I guess ultimately the question comes down to is, we're determining the full wave of, of the heart signal. Then the question comes down to is, so what? What other entries, either patient reported outcomes, are we also enabling so that we can determine pre and post what was happening? Are there additional applications that are being reported either ambiently or through patient entries to be able to add context to whatever cardiac event happened? 
Well, I think one big area where we could be collecting data and actually the data could help uh, is uh, in the area of, of uh, emergency room visits for heart attacks, many of which are false heart attacks. And that is one of the largest costs in a healthcare system. So, so think about if this data was available to EMS personnel as they are transporting someone to the ER, if they could tell what was really happening, if this was a true cardiac event or not, that could definitely uh, keep the costs down and improve treatment in real time. And that data, all that data collected in an ER setting could, could add to the big data that would then continue to be more precise and helpful. I think it's also important to know that, that the full blood pressure waveform is a lot more than just the two numbers that you typically get when you put a cuff on your arm and, and, and take your blood pressure. The full blood pressure waveform gives an awful lot more information about how well the heart is functioning, the stroke volume, the blood flow, and a lot of other information. Also, as we progress with this device, we will also be able to add uh, electrocardiogram, uh, heart and lung sounds, temperature, core temperature, and some other things. So, so eventually this will be a diagnostic tool, a remote diagnostic tool, which we believe very strongly is frankly going to be the future of medicine. Absolutely, um, and especially the fact that it's seamless, that you're not carrying a phone around and more importantly, it's that issue that comes down to biased personal entries and right. all these other things. So it's just going to have this very interesting piece. Now, well, you brought up, go ahead. Sorry, Nance. I'm sorry. There's one, one other thing that I think is really important about, about what we're developing here. And that is the ability of this device to store some information. Mm -hmm. So if you are someone who's already had a heart, a heart attack or a stroke or, or knows you've got tough to control hypertension, you are already worried about things. I mean, it's, it's just naturally in, in the back of your mind all the time. So to Denise's point, it helps knowing whether or not you are actually having a cardiac event. But let's say, for example, you've got this device and you're just not feeling very well. So you could walk into a doctor's office or call your doctor or whatever, and they can download the information from the device real time and tell you right then what's going on. So that, that ability to download real time information, or if you walk into a doctor's office, walk into an ER, they can get that download. It's like Dr. Spock on um, Star Trek, you know, where they download that information and they can tell, they'll be able to tell right away whether something is right or not right. So um, wanting to ask the question around the practicality of these sorts of embedded sensors, what has the feedback been from the typical patient? You know, like I said, it's one thing about carrying a cell phone around, which is currently what we use or external devices where entries are made. Um, and it's a whole other thing to get something embedded. You know, again, we've heard of, of the issues around Neuralink, Elon Musk's Neuralink with a silicon chip that's embedded in your cerebrum, you know, this is a little bit better because it's just really around your aorta. People have fears of this thing that's gonna be in your body and is it gonna crunch my aorta or, you know, or whatever. Um, so how do you speak to that, Denise, around people's fears of something being in their body? Well, for the first question we, we always get is why can't this be wearable device? And there's plenty of studies that show that you cannot get accurate information on blood pressure on a wearable device. It's just impossible. There's too much motion artifact. Um, so in terms of, of being an implanta implantable device, as, as Nancy said, I mean, it really is going to be the future. Um, it's an outpatient procedure, uh, local anesthesia, about 20 minutes. It's very easy. We have talked to a number of cardiac surgeons and cardiologists and who have said, if I was, was actually going in to do another procedure, I would surely just put this in as a, a preventative measure and give me you know, better insight into my patient. So um, you know, we are moving towards the future. It's not here yet, but, uh, and our device is so small uh, and, and cost-effective. So 
I think, you know, those are the responses that we, we give when people ask the question. You know, there's one, one more thing that I think people, people need to understand as well. There are over a million pacemakers implanted a year in this country. And right now there are well over 3 million people with implanted cardiac devices, let alone the other things that, that, that people have. There are over 3 million people already. If somebody is going in, if they've got some underlying cardiac disease and they're going in to have a pacemaker or, or a defibrillator or a VLAD or something else being implanted, this can be done at the same time and can actually be complementary to those things. The biggest difference is those things don't measure blood pressure. Those are more reactive. Those are more fix something when, when, when you, you see something happening and then they're electrical systems. So our device can couple with and be a great complement to a lot of these other things as well. Fantastic, so you're saying the Fitbit and the Apple. Yeah, it's not new. It's not. Yeah, new. so you're saying that this would be a compliment to what, like the Fitbits and the Apple smartwatch and all these other well, items. Is that is the that data what could be read to any of those devices? Okay, got but it. But those okay. devices cannot themselves measure accurate blood pressure. Right. I and, and so and that, that's where the differentiator is. Is yes. that where the differentiator absolutely. is, Nance? Yeah. So ab absolutely, Th those are not accurate enough to dose medication. So at all. we're bringing up something that's really interesting here, which is the following. When we talk about continuous monitoring, and you know, we've heard about some of these things about continuous glucose monitoring, and now we're looking at your device, which is gonna be continuous cardiac monitoring, et cetera. The question comes down to is around workability and practi practicality, and also the evolution of the physician's perspective um, and their role in the, you know, today and in the future. Because one of the questions can come down to is about the possibility of data overwhelm. We're not just talking about small glitches or small amounts of data. We're talking about continuous data. We're talking, multiply that by the numbers of patients. And we're talking about boatloads of data and an ongoing basis. So the question for you, Nance, is around how do we manage potential con conception of data overwhelm how do we deal with interoperability of ensuring that this data fits nicely into a physician's workflow and in whatever tools they're already using? And how do we eventually speak to this idea of skill sets around becoming data scientists and, and like really transferring about how you do medicine in the future? So I know there's a lot packed in there, um, but I'd love to get your perspective. Sure, I think the key thing is that our device does a lot more than simply measure something and transmit data. We're in the process now of developing uh, machine learning diagnostic algorithms that will on a continuous basis with the machine learning and, and AI capabilities that were that, you know, that technology is moving forward very, very quickly we will be able to make ongoing continuous assessments of whether or not for you, because everybody's a little bit different, for you, whether or not the measurements we are taking are normal or abnormal. Are we seeing patterns that we don't like or are the patterns just fine? So, so we are not talking about constant data streaming. I mean, if somebody wants that, they can certainly have that. But what we're talking about is the ability to use our algorithms and machine learning capability to detect any kind of an abnormal occurrence or pattern, and that data will be sent. An alert, an alarm will go off saying, hey, something doesn't quite look right. You better pay attention to this, or uh-oh, get yourself to the hospital, or let's talk to your physician about this. So we are developing these machine learning algorithms now that are going to control that kind of data flow to a great extent. And ultimately it will be up to the physician or the central monitoring station with the clinicians who watch this kind of thing to determine when to do something and when not to do something. And, and, and those 
trigger points will be built into the algorithm based on the physician's guidance for that particular patient. And, and I'll just add once again, it's analogous to the glucose monitor because I have personal experience with this. My husband wears one and it is exactly that. It's calibrated to the person. There are alerts and alarms. It is not intrusive at all. And I mean, this, his glucose monitor is more intrusive than ours because it's on a patch. I mean, he has to change the patch every once in a while uh, with a needle attached, but he can swim, he can do whatever. It's not, and he doesn't even realize it's there, but it's not continually sending him information. It's only sort of, you know, an alert situation when needed. What about the interoperability piece of this, right? Workflow, people building habits at the physician level. Um, making it part of what they do and what they think about. How is that being integrated in the RTM tools? Well, we've been, we've been talking from the outset, we've been talking to quite a few cardiologists. As we mentioned earlier, Jeff is a cardiac anesthesiologist and works with people all, all the time on these issues. And they're very, very interested in it. And in fact, frankly, we have several cardiologists who have already invested in RTM. So, so they're looking at ultimately how to make their lives simpler as well, uh, have better care for their patients, have broader accessibility, because right now, a lot of times they see their patients for the first time on a stretcher. You know, they, they don't want to see this. So, so to make this kind of healthcare more available, uh, more accurate, more predictive, and, and hopefully more preventive and actually much lower cost is something that they're interested in as well. And as I said, we have several cardiologists who have already invested in RTM. We talk about the cost effectiveness of this and obviously the bigger perspective around health economics at, you know, and a bigger systems thinking concept of this. So Denise, um, wanting to kind of evaluate from your standpoint is what sort of economic evaluations are being conducted in order to make the case for public or payer, a, a private payers to be able to, you know, basically pay for these devices? And, and, and what standard of care are you comparing this to? Well, uh, I'll follow up on Nancy's comments about talking to cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. And uh, the name of the game is keeping people out of the hospital because that's what keeps costs down. And in the US, the Affordable Care Act actually rewards hospital systems and physicians for keeping their patients out of the hospital and particularly keeping them from going back in. So if they've had a procedure and they've left the hospital, it, it, you know, they are working very hard not to have recidivism, which would be having them return um, that is a big metric that is, is being followed. So all of this plays into the overall macro vision of where healthcare is going in the US, which is much more uh, cost-effective, much more uh, patient uh, community managed. And that all, all points directly to continual monitoring of populations, population health. Fantastic. And then so sort of drawing or lingering on that a few minutes is that if there is going to be some of these fundamental impacting changes on population health management in a, in a very big way, I mean, there, there could be huge ramifications of this, is um, how are you considering looking at your device as potentially being a digital therapeutic as, as you know, uh, defined by the FDA in sort of that realm of digital therapeutics or software as a medical device and being able to take it through the appropriate clinical trial protocols and regulatory reviews so that it actually can get public payment at a, at a very large scale in the US. Is that part of the plan? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a, a, let me give you a little background on where we are right now and, and where we see this, this very uh, issue that you bring up going. Uh, first of all, our, our cardiac device has been implanted in animals for over a year. Uh, the animals are doing great. We have seen absolutely no tissue or blood flow or any other kind of health impact on the animal. 
And importantly, our device output, the data that we're getting from the device very closely matches the reference catheter system that's currently used in hospitals. So we know fundamentally that, that, that this device works. We've also um, just very recently submitted what's called a pre-sub to the FDA to have our device considered as a breakthrough device. And um, by the way, just as an aside, our respiratory device has already been designated a breakthrough device by the FDA. But, but that designation, first of all, is not that easy to get. And second of all, the FDA gives that designation when they, when they perceive that, that an invention or, so, or something that you're working on in development has the potential to expand and improve healthcare, that it's unique and hasn't been done before, and that, that ultimately can help people. So, so we are applying for that kind of designation. Now, where does this all fit in? The Center for Medicare and Medicaid just this past summer has made a proposal that any device that is designated a breakthrough device by the FDA and is also approved for market application by the FDA will automatically be covered by Medicare and Medicaid. And so once you get to that point and Medicare Medicaid picks up coverage, it's a relatively speaking short step to get private payers to do the same. That's very promising. And obviously that's a key issue, especially in this social si right. situation that we find a lot of ourselves in. Many people have lost their you know, private insurance. And so the question comes down to of the, the economics of this. And so I'm just kind of transporting us into the post COVID-19 pandemic new normal that we find ourselves in. Denise, how does this paint the picture of what the future looks like in terms of patients being able to access? We hear a lot about this concept of the digital divide. This may fit under that. Is there some concerns about patient access to the RTM units or, um, or tools? Well, I would say that, you know, to the extent that Medicare and Medicaid is going to cover, let's talk about our wearable device, uh, going to cover that, I think the access will be quite, quite easy. It's it's low, you know, it's a low cost device, very low cost, um, compared to what has the way they're monitored now in the hospital on very very costly equipment. Um, this is a very simple, easy, inexpensive device that since we have breakthrough designation will be covered by insurance. Um, it's also, uh, let, you know, let's look at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, you're, it's a respiratory monitor and it has a lot of different applications, but one of the applications is to be able to intervene in time to detect uh, an opioid overdose and prevent uh, an overdose situation. But it's also for anyone on pain management regimen after surgery, et cetera, both in hospital and out. And it's a risk management tool, quite frankly, for any pain uh, medicine doctors. We've talked to a number who have said, you know, if we could monitor our patients using a device like this, we would know immediately if they were improperly using their medication. So all these things are, uh, you know, definitely in line for insurance reimbursement because of the way they prevent much larger costs in the system. Michael, yes. you might can you say yeah, something about the Joint Commission. Oh yeah, well, so the other thing is the Joint Commission, which, which um, gives a certification for 20,000 uh, hospitals and healthcare institutions has recommended that anyone taking any form of opioid uh, have respiratory monitoring going on continuously. And right now there is no way to do that for an ambulatory patient. Fantastic. And I'm going to get into the opioid in just a moment. Just wanted to finish off things around the CV uh, monitoring tool. So we have a lot of, we work a lot with life science companies, pharmaceutical, medical device, biotech, you know, uh, other kinds of groups there. 
Just curious, Nance, is part of your roadmap, your strategic roadmap in potentially de developing partnerships with these companies. They're thinking about going beyond the pill, being able to potentially leverage systems like yours to extend patents uh, or to optimize or to competitively differentiate their products from others in very crowded marketplaces in the CV space. So have you had those discussions or is that part of your strategic roadmap moving forward? Sure, we've actually, we've actually had some preliminary discussions and most of those companies were interested in our animal data, which we now have a year's worth of animal data. So we are on the cusp of going back to them. I think it's also important to notice, uh, to say with regard to your, your uh, intellectual property question, we now have seven patents on our cardiac device. And this, these are utility patents, design patents, application patents. And uh, so we're building a very nice patent estate around this as well. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we were one of six companies out of 54 internationally that were given finalist status. And, uh, and we were invited by Boston Scientific and Google to give a presentation up in Boston on our, on our device. So we've already begun talking with uh, some of the, the larger companies that frankly, we hope to partner with as we move forward with, uh, with further development on, on our device. So that's, that's clearly on our timeline. Denise, you, were you started to introduce the other preventative tool that you have, which is the monitoring for respiratory failure due to opioid misuse in basically in the ambulatory setting. Fast forward us to the post COVID pandemic. And we, I'm just curious about what you saw as being, if you saw that as an accelerant of its use of, um, if, of the need, and maybe you can explain a little bit about how that particular monitor works. Well, first of all, the, our respiratory device um, does, a, it, it has many applications. Our first FDA application is towards the opioid application, but it has both medical and non-medical applications. I think, you know, what COVID has done, it has really raised the awareness of the importance of respiratory health um, because many people that have COVID are having respiratory distress without having any respiratory symptoms yet. And, and our respiratory monitor would detect that. In fact, we, we did get a small grant to investigate um, our respiratory monitor uh, applicability to detecting uh, respiratory di distress from viral or bacterial issues. So there are a number, uh, and I, to your point, yes, I think, I think the COVID situation has definitely increased the awareness um, and the importance of respiratory health. So Nance, can you expand on that as well too, is how can this be used for COVID-19, I don't know, contact tracing, monitoring, determining, you know, from a preventative standpoint, or even potentially as, you know, managing people through their condition or disease, maybe if they're in, you know, quarantine, or if they're just kind of going through the, 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 the condition and then being able to monitor them through. So can you explain a little bit about how the AI algorithm within the monitor is going to help to get smarter and really being able to provide the right measurements and um, alerts, if you will, through this process? Sure. First of all, the, the, the key differentiator for our respiratory monitor is the fact that it can not only uh, monitor and determine respiratory rate, which is how many times per minute, for example, you're breathing. But it can also determine the volume of your breath. And those two things taken together are basic respiratory function. The devices that are currently out, most of them will only measure respiratory rate. So it doesn't indicate how much air you're actually taking in. Uh, secondly, our device is wearable and it's wireless and it does not require a mask. And there is no other device today
monitor both rate and volume without a mask. It just can't be done right now today, except with, with, uh, with our device. So when we talk about it's used in a COVID application, think about all of the people who are in nursing homes. Think about all the people who are living alone. Think about all the people who are compromised in, in some other health way. And the fact that they could, and, and a lot of these people to Denise's point, may end up being infected by something like COVID and they're not even aware of it until their oxygen levels get very low and they begin to have breathing difficulties. And oftentimes at that point, they're ready for the hospital and a ventilator. And sometimes it's just too late to do that. Our device can pick up the patterns well before that event happens, number one. Number two, you could put these on very easily, put these on nursing home uh, residents. You can put them on people who live alone. And again, just like our cardiac monitor, these devices can send alerts and alarms to a cell phone or a monitoring station, a physician, a clinician, so that people can keep track of what's going on. I mean, just imagine if this thing were available today in nursing homes. You could put this, we're talking about a couple hundred dollars a unit. It is not expensive. And to put this kind of a device on nursing home patients and, and not only from their own uh, comfort level, uh, emotional comfort level, but their family's co comfort level that they are being continuously monitored, which as you know, with the test for COVID, I mean, they're getting a lot better, but they're not continuous and they're not instantaneous or anything like that. So this could really help a lot in that kind of a situation. So we're talking about a potential game changer. So the intuitive question comes next, Denise, is if this is kind of a no brainer, what is preventing all of the, you know, long-term care facilities from using this? I'd really like to get a description from you of how this gets put on to a elderly person. Like what we talked earlier about the cardiovascular gets embedded into, you know, around the aorta. So how does this get used or how do they, how, how, how is it applied? And secondly, why is this not being taken on wholeheartedly by every long-term uh, care facility in the country? Well, first of all, we have to wait for FDA approval. <laughs> so as soon as our device is approved, uh, then it can be. Um, it's very simple. It's about the size of a quarter and it fits on the sternal notch uh, by a, you know, uh, FDA approved medical adhesive, which are used, you know, on a number of devices. And it's very simple. It's just right on there, take it off. Um, it can be recharged like a, uh, a set of, you know, iPods, uh, earphones, for example. So it's very easy and it's very cost effective. You know, the only thing that enables that kind of monitoring today is in hospital requires a mask and it, it's a piece of equipment that's several thousand dollars. So we're talking about, you know, one twentieth of the cost of the standard for respiratory monitoring today. So yes, I mean, as soon as it's approved, there's nothing that would prevent. And especially because we have breakthrough device status, you know, it will be covered uh, by insurance, so. So Nance, how could this potentially be applied to other areas outside of the obvious, which is the COVID-19 pandemic that we all are dying to get out of? Uh, so this seems like the, the most uh, important approach. But then as we start to look at secondary groups, people who are athletes, people who wanna measure their VO2 max and other sorts of things, how can this device apply to them and how will they use this information? Sure, well, we've got, we've got as Denise said earlier, both, both other medical and also non-medical applications. We talked about the, the opioid issue and just one quick word on that. The first, our first target market is actually the hospitals. Uh, as, as Denise said, the Joint Commission is recommending that anybody on opioid management be continuously monitored. Right now, there's a very small fraction of the post-surgical patients in hospitals. And, and each year there's probably 40 million of them in this country. 
uh, only a small fraction of those people are continuously monitored because the devices used in hospitals are big, bulky. They require uh, patients to be stationary and hooked up to tubes and wires and all this kind of thing. And on average cost five to seven to $8,000 per unit. Our unit can, can, uh, is only gonna cost a couple hundred dollars. It can be used on all of the patients in the hospital to monitor respiratory depression, which happens in almost 40% of the patients in hospital. That could ultimately lead to really bad outcomes. So, so that's one application. The other medical applications are for people with respiratory, chronic respiratory diseases, such as COPD and asthma, We've talked to, for example, some pulmonary physical therapist who said that they'd love to have this device to help their patients train them how to breathe and get themselves out of some breathing difficult situations by having the device actually tell them what to do, how to breathe, how quickly to breathe, how deeply to breathe, and those kinds of applications. Move over to the non-medical applications, and we can start talking about the fact that your respiratory function will be a better indicator in some cases than your heart rate on how physically fit you are. So for example, if you run up a flight of steps, how you're breathing at the top of that flight of steps is a really good indicator of how physically fit you are. But today there are some monitors and some athletes, work weekend warriors, people that are, that are serious about this stuff will wear a respiratory monitor, but those monitors are usually chest straps. They usually only monitor rate. They don't monitor volume. You need both the rate and the volume to give an indication of how much oxygen you're taking into your body. Oxygen is the power source, if you will, for your muscles. That's a key indicator. And we're, we're, we're talking with several uh, sports groups, athletic trainers at, at a couple universities right now, and they're very anxious to, uh, to try our device. And we also are working with some brilliant scientists on our algorithm development, signal processing, so that we can get fairly accurate measurements. And, and so far our, our results are looking pretty good. So this has broad application. It can also be used in industrial safety applications for people who are in confined spaces, for, for pilots, for um, emergency workers, for firefighters, and, and those people where tracking respiratory function becomes important. We've also talked to the military. The military is, is, is interested in and these things for training, uh, beginning to predict heat exhaustion and people that are running with 50 pound backs, uh, packs on, on their back. And, and those kinds of applications, it could help with triage in, uh, in medical situations in the field. So this device, because it can measure both the rate and the volume, just has all kinds of applications and, and the, the not just the device, but the algorithms that we're very actively developing, the signal processing that we're very actively developing will be specific for each of these applications. That's really interesting going from opioid to all of these multiplicity opportunities. And quite yeah. frankly, one of the other things when you're talking about breathing is potentially direct to consumer around meditation practices and how people are breathing or not breathing. Exactly. So it's very, yeah. very interesting. At the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to data and data gets collected in data lakes and these late data lakes get refined like oil refineries and they get leveraged. And ultimately the, the powerful purpose is for population health management, predict, predictive yeah. analytics, and you know how to actually do things from a forensic standpoint. And with that comes fear. We saw this with the COVID-19 contact tracing people don't want to share their data. So you have you're, you really have populations that are very split on what it means around data ownership, data sharing, what should and shouldn't be shared. What is your perspective, Denise, on that whole perspective? Well, I mean, you're right. And it's, it's, it's certainly an evolving field, but it is here to stay. 
I mean, we, we've seen a number of situations where, you know, data collection has been incredibly helpful. And, you know, I think it's, it's just, we're moving along a continuum of acceptance. Now there's, a, there's guardrails being set up, obviously, uh, legislation being set up for sharing data and data privacy and all those good things. And I think, you know, with more and more of those guardrails, I think consumers will come along uh, and be more accepting. And also I, I do think something like the pandemic, even though the, the contact tracing hasn't been completely accepted, I do think people can understand if they believe that COVID is real, uh, that you know this is important and it's helpful and it can prevent harm. And so I think, you know, it's like anything, any breakthrough, anything new, it's it's a continuum and it's an education. And it's not gonna happen overnight, but it is happening. And I think, you know, there will be, I'm confident that there will be enough guardrails and security features put in place that we will be able to make large impacts and keep people safe. Love it. We're talking about the evolution of these products and the fact that they're going to be, they are going to be interoperable and we're going to live in an ecosystem of, of, of algorithms that are going to be speaking to each other. So with that in mind, Nance, what is your vision for being able to create the so what behind the alert notification? For example, being able to notify the pharmacy that, you know, a new prescription needs to be um, sent off or sudden, or maybe it sends a signal to um, a, a drug, an intravenous drug that needs to get pumped into somebody's arm that they need, you know, something more put into their body to manage whatever condition that they're running into. Or even for just people living in their own home, a message being sent to Alexa and something being sent off automatically to Amazon for that to be delivered immediately to their home. What is What does that vision look like in terms of overarching AI interoperability? Well, I think, it, you know, it's like, it's like any progress that's made uh, in any single field. Once people begin to realize and accept the fact that there is a personal benefit to something like this, they begin to, they begin to accept it. And if, if you look backwards over the last five to 10 years, the, the kind of world we're living in today and with the interconnectedness, the sharing of information, the, the, uh, the capabilities that are just in your cell phone today. The fact that we're just having this meeting right now on Zoom, which, which frankly was a big deal just even five years ago. I, I can remember having these giant dedicated video conference rooms that never seemed to work, you know, in, uh, in, in different places. And look at what we can do today. So, so this then becomes part of what we do and, and how we live. And I think the, the younger generations grew up this way. They don't know a life without a cell phone. They don't know a life without the kind of social media that, that's going on, on, on today. And so I think the acceptance level for these kinds of things is higher to begin with. And as technology moves forward and these capabilities expand and there are opportunities for people who don't today have access to healthcare. Look at, look at what's happened in so many areas of the world that are not hardwired. They all have cell phones. It's a lot easier to have a cell phone than it is to have a landline in many places around the world. These places are in many cases and many situations farther behind in terms of healthcare. Think about the kind of capability that we can bring to people who don't have access today with the kind of things that RTM and others are doing now. It, it, it's a game changer. It's an absolute game changer and can improve people's lives and, and expand access to healthcare in a way that we've never seen before. This, this is the future of medicine, it really is. I love leaving this meeting and this conversation on such a high note because I truly believe as we do it at Impetus, that it's about mindset. It's about belief systems. And as you mentioned so eloquently, Denise, it really just requires iteration. 
And it takes these courageous conversations right. for us to keep iterating, disrupting, and getting more and more people involved until we can change that belief system. So wonderful conversation. For anybody who's listening to this to podcast or YouTube afterwards, we're gonna be sharing the links to speak with Nance or Denise if you wanna partner or discuss or see what else that you can actually do some work with them. We also encourage you to check out our website at impetusdigital.com. These are the kinds of things that we actually do. We bring stakeholders together in a series of asynchronous and synchronous virtual uh, touch points where we can have these big, hairy, audacious conversations. We can work with stakeholders on what if and how do we do this and how do we create new position statements and documents and, and ideas and garner insights. And this is exactly what we do. So if you're interested in doing that with Nance and Denise or anybody else, this is exactly what we do at Impetus. Please actually like this video or subscribe so other people can also find this information. We really appreciate all of your time. Thank you, Nance and Denise, for a fantastic conversation. We're super thrilled to see what you're going to be doing and also what's going to be happening to your company in the next few years. And thanks to all of you. Wishing you all a happy and healthy day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. We appreciate it.